The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. We're talking about the Christian music industry on the show today. Of course, you know, that's my old stomping ground, right? My guest is documentary filmmaker Grace Baldridge. She has a lot to say on the subject. Before we get into that discussion, you know, I'm interested in the larger question of how music affects us. And neuroscientists have actually explored the physiological effects that music has on the brain, why musical behaviors are actually part of how human beings evolved, music as language, tools for expression, how musical training can actually help us in non-musical ways like speaking and reading comprehension, how music is used in the treatments for things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Check out Dr. Ani Patel's lecture series called Music. Music and the Brain at The Great Courses Plus. Right now, you can watch the whole thing for free. Music and the Brain, it's just one of thousands of lectures at The Great Courses Plus on a huge variety of subjects, from technology to how viruses work to learning a foreign language. You can stream from your device. You can listen with The Great Courses Plus app. Now's the perfect time to sign up. My listeners today get free access to their entire library. So don't wait any longer. Sign up today using my special URL. Start your free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. That's the great courses plus dot com slash Seth. As a guy who used to do Christian radio, I'm always interested in an examination, kind of a reverse engineering of what the industry was and what it is. I'm going to talk to Grace Baldridge in just a few minutes. Grace is a musician and producer. She is one of the people behind the documentary short called The Dark Reality of the Christian Music Industry. Now, Grace's short-form documentary doesn't get as much into the money, although there's some reference to that. And our show today is not going to be quite as much about the finances. It's really more about the masking off of the imperfections of people and the selling of a specific artist, kind of artist, image, veneer, so to speak. They act a certain way. They talk a certain way. They're not allowed to say or do specific things. They are supposed to be authentic and themselves as long as that authenticity is approved by the people who are writing the checks and making the record deals, etc. That's what we're going to talk a lot about today. Just some foundational information about Christian music. It is one of the most popular formats in the United States. No kidding. More than 1,400 radio stations, 80 million listeners of some flavor of Christian or gospel music. For CCM, contemporary Christian music, three-quarter are adults, 25 to 54. The majority of those people are women. Now, there's a reason for that. When I was in Christian radio, our target demographic was women. We knew from our research that when families were just starting out, just having their kids, they became immediately conscious that they are supposed to have their kids in church, right? They didn't go to church much. They weren't interested in religion. Oh, shit. Now we've got a baby. We need to go to church to make sure that that child is being raised with good values. This was much of the mindset. We also understood that if you got a van full of people, let's say it's mom and dad and the kids, it was usually the mom, the woman who determined what was on the radio. So by targeting the female, we got dad and the kids by default. That was how Christian music was marketed. The industry began on a shoestring. 
Back in the 1960s, one of the first rock and roll Christian songs was produced by a guy named Larry Norman. It was called Why Should the Devil Have All the Good Music? By the 1980s, artists like Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, DeGarmo and Key, Whiteheart, David Meese, etc. sort of laid a foundation with these hole-in-the-wall bargain basement record companies. And then in the mid-1990s, in the wake of the satanic panic when everybody was freaked out about the devil, wholesome music became really attractive and the industry exploded and all these major record labels jumped in and scooped up these boutique labels. They took over the whole ball game, money and marketing and radio airplay and you name it. It became really big business. And in order to sell albums, you got to sell an image. And that's much of what I want to talk about today with my guest. Some people already familiar with Grace Baldridge and her work. If you're not, let me provide a quick foundation for that. She's a writer and producer. Her documentary work in the past has covered everything from serial killers like Edmund Kemper to the Salem Witch Trials to a TV series called What the Flick. And Pop Trigger, which was an offshoot or a part of the Young Turks. The reason she and I are talking today is because she was host and co-producer of a short-form documentary called The Dark Reality of the Christian Music Industry. Grace, it's good to have you on the broadcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I mean, I've already mentioned some of the work you do. You want to take that any further or elaborate? Sure. I am a musician and I also work in digital and alternative media. So um, documentaries and the podcast space, that sort of thing. And the way that you and I um, became familiar with each other was through a docu-series that I host for Refinery29 called State of Grace, where we travel the country in search of difficult conversations about the intersection of faith in different social issues. So, for example, we've covered... um, how people are influenced by their faith on issues of life and death, uh, the death penalty and abortion. Um, We've looked at gay conversion therapy, and the episode that you found us on was about the Christian music industry. So I guess that's a brief snapshot of um, kind of what I do and who I am. Oh, I'm also uh, married, uh, gay as hell, to a wonderful wife, and I have two dogs, and one of them is well-behaved. Okay, well, so you're, (laughs) you're a Christian? Do I call you a Christian? Yeah, I am a Christian, yes. Okay. And that is Episcopal? Yes, I am I am a Christian. I like to describe myself as a, a faithful skeptic. I'm a really bad Christian in the sense that a lot of preconceived ideas people might carry about what it looks like to live a Christian life are um, not necessarily things that you'll find in my life. But I am faithful to the Episcopal Church. I was raised by an Episcopal priest And I find a great deal of comfort in my Christian faith. But that said, I'm definitely not someone, and I hope that you you got this from our prior conversation, Seth, that like, I'm really open to all sorts of conversations, different expressions of faith or none thereof, and I'm not threatened by any of that. And I know that that is a little bit unconventional, but that's just sort of the place where I find myself feeling the most at peace. I mean, I have a lot of questions about your faith and how you reconcile that against the Bible. And you yeah. know, that's a whole yeah. other show, Grace. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, book me again. I mean, we'll when you, you know, too. you say <laughs> that you have a wife, right. And you are gay as hell. Yeah. Is that what, is that how you said it? Yeah. I'm gay as hell. I um, did say that. I did. Yeah. And so for those of us, I mean, I realize the Episcopal denomination has a much more, I don't know, they, there's a lot more elbow room in the way they approach the Bible. Would that be a fair way to say it? Yeah, and it's also been an affirming denomination for a while, which means that we were married in the church prior to even when I came out. I saw gay people serving in leadership positions at my own church um, when it was run by my dad. And it, it definitely is a tradition of inclusivity. So that that was sort of the standard that was set for me, I also grew up overseas. I grew up in Belgium, which was the second country in the world to legalize gay marriage. So it wasn't really until I moved to the United States that I came in contact, honestly, with conservative Christianity, and especially with how it um, intersects with the political space, which I think is baffling and bad. <laughs> so that's really what drew my interest. I never thought, I'm, I'm, the, I'm a preacher's kid, like I never thought I would care about religion again. You know, like I'm I'm sick of it. I was raised on like vestry meetings. I'm bored. I'm done. 
And it was actually in moving to an environment where I found my faith being harnessed in such a hostile and harmful way to the most vulnerable and marginalized that I felt this compulsion to dive into these issues. My listeners are going to probably come after me for not going down that rabbit hole a lot further, right? Because there are some, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, the verses of the Bible that address the... The clobber verses. You know, the attitudes, the penalties for same-sex relationships Mm. and reconciling that with the Bible. And that's just going to have to be a different show, I think, Grace. But... Okay. What I really like about you is the fact that you sound like one hell of a humanist, too. You sound like you love and care about people, and you want equality, and you want people to just do the right thing. Damn it. Would that be a fair assessment yes. of your life? <laughs> it would be. I, I mean, it, I think it would be. I do my best. I think, like all of us, I fall short many times, but I definitely do my best to honor that approach to living in this world. Yeah, now, you and I have that in common. Now, I'm going to celebrate what we have in common. What we also have in common is we have a connection to Christian music. What is your connection specifically? Well, first of all, I had the magazine subscription growing up, so there's that. And then growing up, you know, you're raised in the rectory, and I that was the, the CDs that my parents were buying for me. It was all like DC Talk, Newsboys, Reliant K, Switchfoot, all that stuff. And obviously, and mercifully, I did expand my musical taste because I think a lot of those bands leave much to be desired in the way of examining the human condition in the way that I would look for in my music. But that's what, like, that was very much part of my world, like youth group, Christian music, all that stuff. And then you kind of grow up and because very little, although there are exceptions, of Christian music is really diving into the details, the interpersonal. There's only so much they can examine, and there's a certain level of honesty that they are allowed to touch, and then they really can't pull back too many layers. You grow out of it, because as you get older, you realize how messy it is to be human. And the water metaphors of, like, your love is a river, your love is a lake, like, all this, it just doesn't carry you over the finish line, at least in my experience, and I know that that has been shared by other people as well. So I stepped away from the Christian music industry and I found other music that, you know, resonated with me. And then when we started producing episodes for this show, I pitched to the producer. I was like, you know, Christian music is pretty wild because they, they can, they're sort of beyond reproach in anything because they can just sort of shield themselves with, nope, this is for God. Um, and if you don't understand that, you just don't understand God. And there's, I mean, just a wild level of gatekeeping of who is allowed to speak about God and who decides what voices can be sharing their experience with the divine. And I was like, let's look into that. And, you know, we pitch a lot of ideas for episodes. You don't really know which one is going to kind of take. And pretty early on, we had an idea, wow, I think this is a conversation that people are interested to hear in a way that I actually think, you know, I I live in Los Angeles. Most of the people I kick it with are maybe agnostic, um, just not, not, I'm not really hanging in a very religious crowd. Let's just say that. And I think they were like, wow, there really is something here. And I was like, yeah, because this is a major multi-million dollar industry that has sort of unchecked power over the hearts and minds of people in a way that we know music has a unique capacity to do. There were a few people that had reached out to us, like Lauren Deleary, who's featured there, who is in a prominent Christian band. She's the first person that we interview. She actually reached out to me before we even filmed the episode. And it was in speaking with her that I really became convinced, okay, hearing about how purity culture had impacted the the constraints that she faced as a musician, I was like, we got to go to Nashville. We need to have these conversations. Looking at the evolution of, I mean, for lack of a better word, the evolution of contemporary Christian music, I came from the era when they were just going from kind of this bargain basement shot on a shoestring albums. I mean, Mm -hmm. Phil Kagey did a whole album in his basement. The album's called Underground, and he made it for about a buck and Mm -hmm. a half. And so it was this sort of charming boutique industry that got sucked up by the major record labels and became a huge moneymaker and a huge behemoth in the 1990s. And to a Mm -hmm. degree, I think that continues even today. Did you begin in your own research to see that sort of transition from ministry to major business model? Oh, majorly. I I think actually 
the worship side of Christian music is really where they're cashing in, which I think is perhaps one of the more like perverse things when you really think about it. In that worship music is a uh, is you can you can use it for like publishing, but you can also market it to specific churches, and churches can license the music because I didn't know that there's a whole different thing for just a local church to be licensing music from Sony or Capitol or Columbia that is produced under their Christian music umbrella. And so the real cash cow is in that worship and in sort of franchising as many bands and Christian artists as you can. A, a good example, what I mean franchise is think about like the Newsboys. The Newsboys, as they started, have basically an entirely different lineup than they do now. And at this point, they're making different music entirely as well. It really has nothing to do with who they were when they started. Not to say that bands don't evolve, but really, I think what the label holds is the value of the name recognition in a Christian household of the Newsboys. And they're going to buy that record. They're going to go to that concert. They're going to go to that conference if they see the Newsboys on the flyer rather than, OK, the, the, this band is done. It's ran its course. And I think holding on to that and the franchising and the, the marketing and the business side of it is just very sleazy to me. But if you talk about it, if you address it, then it's Again, you don't understand. We serve God. You know, they really do use that sort of shield of this is all done in the name of God. And I'm like, no, it's, this is a business and you are a person who I'm speaking to who are making these decisions. It's not God making these, these these decisions. It's you, my friend. Like, it's you, sir. Interesting side note, George Predikis, who is one of the founding or co-founders of the Newsboys, uh, he left the band before they really came to prominence, but he's an atheist. He speaks out quite a bit online. Mm -hmm. You know, I was interested when you talked about the worship music. I know that uh, if you go to a church, a lot of the contemporary churches, they have these um, packages where the worship songs are played and you'll see the lyrics on the screen with all these backgrounds yeah. and you know, it's very sexy yeah. and, and whatnot. And they actually pay licensing to be able to use that. So even a lot of these packages, which do the visuals for the worship team as they sing the worship songs, are part of a licensed package that they pay for often annually. You're right. It's pretty big business, yeah. this worship industry. And I think it's actually, I think that what I was trying to sort of say, and I think you actually put it far more succinctly, is that that is more lucrative for them, worship music, specifically the songs that you'll sing at youth group, that you'll sing within your church gatherings, is more lucrative because they can really corner that market more. We are in a day and age where this sort of tongue-in-cheek, reliant K, DC talk, newsboys, songs that are like, that have a little bit of faith, but are not, are, are sort of skirting the line. Any mainstream artist can do that on their own. They don't need to belong to a Christian music label to do that. However, to perform a worship song, that is a uniquely Christian thing. And they're really like, okay, this is how we have cornered the market. We are where you go. You want to hear Hillsong, you want to hear Bethel, like this is where you go. No one else is doing this. Two examples that come to mind is like Lady Gaga and Kesha both had two major top 40 hits that were prayerful songs. And we're seeing that more mainstream artists are willing to express faith and they don't need to do that under a Christian label. Whereas before, if you had any sort of expression of faith and it was even sort of remotely poppy, you know, that's going to be on Sparrow Records. That's going to be on whatever, Essential Records. I can't remember all of the different, I used to know them better. I swear <laughs> I had my, my subscription to CCM and I, I'm blanking now. Oh, wait, wait Tooth and Nail, like yeah. all those records. Yeah. You don't need to do that anymore. If you want to write us, if you're a punk kid, you want to write a song about like having a prayerful moment, you can do that. And then you can also like drop an F-bomb in the next song and no one's really going to care. I know that Christian music was a culture of rules when I was in it. And there was a sort of a strict dress code, for lack of a better way of saying it. I mean, you know, you could be edgy, but not too edgy. You could be attractive, but not mm. sexy. There was a a definite mold. And I think that's very much continues today. An airbrushing of real people who are being sort of marketed to a specific demographic. Oh, 100%. It, I think airbrushing of real people is a pretty fair way of characterizing it. Lauren Deleary speaks about this personally in the documentary. Here's a clip. Lauren and her sister performed in a Christian pop band called Love Collide. 
They were Juno award-winning touring artists with three studio albums. Recently, Lauren began deconstructing her faith and pinpointing the ways her beliefs weren't compatible with the pressures of the Christian music industry. Being in the Christian music industry, obviously you have to adhere to purity culture, especially as girls. It's this weird fine line between like you have to obviously look cool but also not be like revealing. I remember one time we were doing a show. I lifted my hands in worship <laughs> and there's like there's like a picture where you can see like this much of like my stomach. How dare you? Yeah, I know, right? I remember somebody tweeted at us and was just like, "How can you like consider yourself a Christian? How can you even say you're worshiping whenever you're like making your brothers in Christ stumble?" With the skin that you're showing with midriff. Is it true you can't like jump and dance on stage? Yeah, yeah. People would complain about it. Men would. Right. And they would say it was too sexual. One of our singles, I Don't Want It. The music video for it, we had like paint, paint dripping. Yeah. And there's one point where I'm singing and so there's like paint dripping down on my face. And we got complaints that it looked like semen. Just out of curiosity, were these people, have we confirmed that they are aware of what semen... <laughs> Just Looks just would be an interesting follow-up, because as far as I know, if it is hot pink, then you should see a doctor. It is an impossible standard. I don't know how, I don't know how they kind of can get away with this, but it's true. It's, you know, you have to be a cool girl, but you have to be modest. And what does that modesty mean? Um, modesty to me is a huge joke, because the type of gay that I am, just in how I dress, I'm extremely modest, like... I'm always covered up, um, but I don't think that a Christian would look at me and be like, that's a good Christian girl, if that makes sense. Um, and so these standards for modesty and for dress are just all over the place. And they're at the women whimsy, again, of gatekeeping executives at the top level who have decided that they're the tastemakers. And unfortunately, in doing that, they are perpetuating harmful standards of purity culture. I remember being behind the scenes. It's interesting. Well, I mean, the, the artists would sometimes share some of the darker parts of their personal lives from the stage. You know, if they if they were being vulnerable and talking about their personal struggles. But you know, there was a lot of just life stuff. You had Christian artists who were alcoholics, and you had Christian artists who'd been through nasty divorces, and you had Christian artists who had mm -hmm. struggled with all kinds of calamity in their lives, or maybe they were just assholes. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. this is a side of the industry that people don't see. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up because one of the individuals we interviewed was the lead singer of a band called I Am They, which definitely falls under that category of 2015 and up of generalized worship type music. And he was talking about how people feel the need to look at people on a stage, let's say a, a performer, an artist, a band, a group, and to project onto them this perfect standard of faith and of faithfulness and obedience to whatever doctrine they're following or whatever doctrine is being prescribed to them because they need to know that it's possible that it's attainable even though i hope we can all recognize that it's not that we're all going to fall short and that there's no perfect example of how to live out, especially in these rigid, conservative, restrictive, repressive Christian doctrines. They're, they're, no one is thriving in that. No one is thriving in that. But you put these people on a stage so people are literally looking up to them as though they are these examples. And it places this overwhelming burden on the people who are just trying to play their music and make their way in the world. He talked about that with singer-songwriter Adam Palmer in the documentary. This is Adam Palmer. He's a songwriter, musician, and former founding member of I Am They, a pop acoustic worship group. After going through a divorce and enduring scorn and criticism from his community, Adam stepped away from the band. He's since been on his own journey, navigating the industry with his own progressive and inclusive faith. I think without saying it, the average Christian listener wants the people on stage to be super Christians. They've really got the faith thing down. They're really dedicated. And like, I read my Bible every single day and night. Like, they want that so that they can project that, oh, that, that exists. And I but can it's strive. it's attainable. It, it's attainable. And look, at they've done it. But really, I found quite the opposite on the road. Yeah. Most people are struggling in their faith. You don't have like a stable 
lifestyle, so you're always kind of in this flux of being confused with life.、Mm. So questions and confusion is like part of the daily life when you're touring. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I mean, do you feel do like it. it's is it an industry of hypocrites? Well, I think in any multi-million-dollar industry, whenever there is an exchange of money, compromises will be made, and where the Christian music industry makes those compromises, I think. Varies from instance to instance, but in acknowledging that, in acknowledging that that's true across the board, then yeah, there are going to be hypocritical practices within the Christian music industry, just as there are going to be in the music industry. I have been reading a lot about、um, reparations within the music industry recently, and that's something. And just outside of Christian music. And I think we can all acknowledge that black artists who created so much culture that white artists stole and profited from, those families should be taken care of. Those artists should be taken care of、uh, in a way that the industry has never acknowledged. But they're really happy to throw out a black square when Black Lives Matter was trending. And so I think holding all industries accountable to their hypocrisy is important. And I'm not holding back on the Christian music industry either. There are true believers. I mean, I'm bumped into them. I mean, they genuinely, when they sing the songs, they buy it. You'd agree with that, right? Sure. Well, I just want to make sure when I say, "Is it a business of hypocrisy?" that it doesn't sound like I'm I'm trying to blanket blame every Christian artist、yeah. for the hypocrisy that exists in the industry. I think we have to be fair. Yeah, I would actually say the least amount of fault with regards to sort of the toxicity within the industry I would place on the artist. I think the artists are largely pawns in a grander scheme of just bad business practices that are built on harmful theologies. Maybe they aren't even built on harmful theologies. I don't know how much people really think about some of these things. My blame is really not on the artists. I think they're kind of secondary to,、um, unfortunately, the structures that have been built around them. And my hope is that. We can be part of a generation and of a conversation that is lovingly saying, "Take this stuff down. This isn't bringing anyone closer to God." Now, I want to talk about this record executive. You brought your cameras in, sat down for an interview with a Christian music executive, had the interview, and、uh, then the interview, after the fact, became so uncomfortable that. He asked to have his segment pulled from the documentary. Yes,、um, that is not that is not exactly what happened. There was a back and forth over email with our producer about just the nature of the conversation, and、um, that email chain started because following our conversation, there was a phone chain of freakout. So much to say. He called someone who called someone who called someone who ended up calling one of our cameramen while we were on another interview, and、um, we're a really small crew and we film. It's about it's four of us, and、um, we were just pretty overwhelmed by the way that like the weight had shifted about our conversation because I could tell that he was uncomfortable, especially like I could tell when he met me. I don't think he'd researched the show, so、um, your viewers will. See me in the thumbnail. I'm just like I said at the top. I'm gay as hell. Like you can clock me from a mile away. Like you know that I'm gay. And I told him towards the end of the interview, I was like, "You probably have guessed that I'm gay." And he was like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Well, I'm going to ask you some questions about inclusion. What do you think? Is there space for an LGBTQ artist in Christian music?" And he gave a very like vague and cagey answer. Just that it never really come up before. I don't know. Blah blah blah. And、then we got back to sort of more、uh, questions in his wheelhouse because I wanted to end the interview so that he would feel comfortable because I recognized that that would you know that that was going to throw him off, but I felt strongly that it was important to ask. And I asked about purity culture as well. And then we left, and I was like, "Oh, that was weird," but it was what it was. And then you know he there's that whole phone chain of freakout, and then there was that email. Chain and by the end of all that conversation, we just decided we're just going to not use you in the piece because, for many reasons, one of which is yeah, we were we were a little bit afraid of the ramifications because we are a small team and we I didn't know that there wouldn't be some sort of like 
maybe legal action or something. I just, we just didn't want it. And I didn't feel as though we'd gotten a strong enough answer from him in the first place to really fight to include it. I felt like I could sum up what he had said on my own um, because he didn't really say anything. And I don't really think he was telling the truth. So, so you think he was hedging? Sort of how we, yeah. I mean, I, I forget yeah, the interruption. 100, oh, 100%. So he's like, oh, yeah. he, he's being a politician, right? He's answering without really oh, answering one, the question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's definitely true. He yeah. asked for like a transcript of the entire interview, which is the first person that we interviewed who had asked for that. So he could like look it over and it was just, it was way too much headache. And it was, the question, Seth, was, do you think that there's space for an LGBTQ artist in the Christian music industry? So if that is a controversy, if that is so controversial, then you've just told me everything I need to know about the state of Christian music. Well, I mean, he lets that, get, let's say he was of an inclusive mindset, though. I mean, that stands against the most literal verses of certainly the Old Testament and... Now he's on record. His whole career is in jeopardy. Yeah. I mean, look at what, what happened with Lauren Daigle when she went on the Ellen show. Were you familiar with that? Please tell me the story. I'm not familiar with it. The short version, and I'm not super brushed up on the details, but basically she performed on the Ellen show. Um, she's a Christian music singer and she's very popular. She had a really successful album. It had a lot of mainstream success as well. And in doing her promotional stuff, she was invited to perform on the Ellen show and a lot of conservative Christians really didn't like that. And she got asked in at least one Christian radio interview, you know, do you think that gay marriage is a sin or do you think that being gay is a sin? And she just sort of said, I don't know. She didn't really give an answer. And so I'm sure that when you look at any example of a prominent Christian artist that is currently, you know, at the top of their game and speaking out, it's bad news. You know, they are not received with any sort of love or any sort of grace with like, oh, well, let me, well, where did you arrive at this conclusion? Because, you know, I've arrived at very different conclusions with regards to LGBTQ plus issues. And that is through biblical study. It's not in the absence of biblical study, but there's no space for that discourse. The Christian music industry has decided this is the theology that we are narrowing in on. And there is no room for any Christian who has arrived at a different conclusion. We've decided we are right. I remember when uh, Christian artist Jennifer Knapp and also uh, beloved yeah. Christian artist Ray Bolts, they publicly came out as gay, yep. and the industry kind of cast them off. we got to talk more about that, like being gay and reconciling that with Christianity, specifically the book, the holy book of Christianity. I'm going to talk about that with Grace Baldridge. Plus, we will go to the switchboard. It's all happening right after this. Would you like me to do a special greeting for you on your phone? I just started doing this a little while ago, and it is a ball. I'm on Cameo, and you can go to Cameo.com and just search my name, Seth Andrews. It's a few bucks to do, which helps me fund the work. Specifically, right now, I'm funding ghost stories and all the voice talent I've hired for my ensemble finale piece. But mostly, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, all of a sudden, your friend or family member gets a notification. Hey, it's Seth. Happy birthday. Happy anniversary. Happy whatever. If you'd like me to do a special greeting for you or somebody you know and love, go to Cameo.com and just search my name, Seth Andrews. Talking here with my special guest, Grace Baldridge, a documentary filmmaker. We're talking about the documentary short film called The Dark Reality of the Christian Music Industry. Any other discoveries when you were shooting the documentary about Christian music? Any other revelations where you were like, oh, wow, I never expected this? Anything like that pop up on your radar? Well, I think the one thing that I walked away from was feeling a great deal of hope for people who have found comfort in worship music, but don't identify within the rigid parameters that worship music and the Christian music industry has often prescribed. I walked away feeling like there was so much resilience in the human spirits that I met with that 
I'm excited to see what people create, you know, because I think more and more, you, you mentioned Phil Kagey making uh, his, an album in his basement, and more and more people are able to do that. You know, you can basically create a home studio. I have something like that for my own music. And I'm excited for people who have been told there isn't a place for them in Christian music to create their own stories. If you are, you know, worshiping a loving God and you have something to say about that, but you don't fit in with the structures, the rigid structures that have cast you out and have said that you're too different, there's no place for you. I can't wait to see people create in spite of that and to thrive and to share their stories. And you can do that and then put it on Spotify or iTunes, baby, SoundCloud, and you can take off and you can find your audience. And that's what gives me a great deal of, um, of hope and knowing that people will support you. I think that the Christian music industry and has done a pretty good job of in their lack of recognizing any sort of marginalized identities that they kept us feeling very separate and apart from each other. Um, and we were sort of compartmentalized like, Oh, we were alone. No one else is going through this. No one else understands, but there is a great deal of community and there's a, a number of people who want to connect with people in this way. And we have social media now. We don't need CCM magazine to be distributing these albums or whatever. We can do this on our own. And it's, this is something you feel strongly called to. You can organize yourself and you can go on a weird ass worship tour with a bunch (laughs) of other outcasts and you can do it. And I will attend and maybe you will too, Seth. And I just, I want to speak to the sort of resilience of the human spirit that CCM is a powerful industry, but they're nothing on the human spirit. The same is true with radio, you know, 20 years ago before internet radio, you know, you had to, play by somebody else's rules and you're in a limited market and you have to fit a certain thing and you read the liner cards and if you screw up they'll replace you in five minutes and you kind of have to do it their way and then all of a sudden now i get to be a broadcaster radio guy podcaster interviewer storyteller whatever i get to do it on my terms i also get to determine when we take listener calls which we're going to do right now area code 716 Hi, who's this? This is Bunny. Thanks for calling. Comment or question? My question was, as somebody who used to be on worship teams uh, and was discriminated against both because of physical appearance or size, as well as insinuations about sexuality, I was wondering if in the worship leading teams and things like that, has anybody seen or either of you seen where there's people that would like to participate or have the skills to participate and are kept from that and even maybe from attending churches because they they don't fit in that box, even on a smaller scale. I can definitely speak to that. Actually, not within the specific episode that Seth and I connected on. Um, That was more about the industry artists that are packaged and produced for a label. But we did another episode about celebrity-endorsed mega churches that are very trendy. You kind of know the type that I'm referring to, uh, very Instagrammable churches. <laughs> and in our interviews for that episode, we didn't really get to include it in the final edit. Unfortunately, we were constrained by time. But there was a lot of discussion about the worship team and the hierarchy within the worship team, not just on sexuality, although there were definitely discriminatory practices there, but just in like vague perceptions of what is trendy, sort of like what will play well to a new attendee coming to this church who will look cool on stage. I'm about to blow your mind. We sat down with a guy who's actually become a friend of mine since we filmed who was their lighting and like their tech guy. And not everyone's mics would be turned on because some people were just up there because they fit the bill of what they were trying to project their church was. And that to me, I think says a lot about sort of the optics of a lot of these very trendy hipster churches. And that is absolutely antithetical to how I understand my faith and how, you know, how we understand to be inclusive of all people, regardless of if they wear the type of clothing that you think is cool. Like, where show me that Bible passage. Yeah, no, that's definitely similar to my experience. And, and things got much worse, but 
I was actually set aside and told to speak with the pastor's wife about something that that they didn't really even have evidence of. But I think it was more of an mm-hmm. excuse because it's like she she doesn't fit. She's not one of us. Yeah, and then also so, that the, yeah, the worship think- team were typically like the cool kids, I guess, which again I think is counter to what I feel guided to believe with regards to being inclusive of all people. There shouldn't be a clique in a church. It's not just there are cliques. It's only the highest of the ranks of the cliques get to be portrayed on the pedestal. It's almost like Mm -hmm. worship of the people instead. And if it doesn't work or if the sound system isn't good, like we're worshiping the, the images and the sounds instead. And I think that is very interesting from something that's supposed to be theistic. It's kind of Mm. putting people on the pedestal. Yeah. Thank you so much for the call. I appreciate you very much. Thank Thank you. you. She reminds me of something, Grace. We used to, it's a mega church in Dallas. We used to call it the church of the pretty people. And they all seem to have been cut from the same cloth. And I remember watching their praise and worship Sunday morning. And when it was over, I actually had the thought, well, thanks for the show. Right? It's the first thing I thought mm-hmm. because it was just like the lighting and the fog and the graphics and everybody was dressed a certain way. And and it, I felt like this is packaging. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, is that I, I'm a big fan of consistency. And if you can just be consistent with me, I kind of will respect you and be like, peace be with you. So if you're going to put on a show acknowledge that it's a show. Worship is not the primary focus. If not everyone's mics are on on stage, you're not trying to amplify voices. You're trying to amplify images of what you want to project out into the world, that this is what your ideal parishioner looks like. This is the Instagrammable type of parishioner that you want to put out for the world to see. And just be honest and consistent that that's what you're doing. Don't you know, put on a show and you can probably do it in an incredible way. And we, we know that the physiological effects of a smoke machine, of lighting, of the cadence of Christian music, of the tones, the chord structures, we know that that has this physiological impact on our nervous system, on how we are understanding the world around us in a way that might be heightened to think that you're having a spiritual experience. And so that's amazing. And you can get that from a Broadway show and you can get that from a worship service. But let's be honest about what we're doing. You're you're a weird Christian. Like That's something I I would say. That's something I would say. Yeah. Like you can get that experience organically without having worship lyrics. I actually had this conversation with John Steingart former lead singer mm. of uh, Hawk Nelson's, we were talking about sort of conditioned response, et cetera. Yeah. You've seen, I've seen people, they become disillusioned with the airbrushing of ministry, the business, the money, right? They, they see mm-hmm. it and they then walk away. Uh, you've seen people disconnect. Maybe you were one of those people, right? Once you begin to see the man behind the curtain, it actually yeah. drives you out the door to go do or try something else. Would that be the case with mm-hmm. you? Or Yeah, I, I definitely think that I had to come about sort of reclaiming my faith in a very different way than I think is common for many people. Because when it was something I never questioned, I was very bored of it because I grew up around church. So the, the novelty of God, like I saw the man behind the curtain, it was my dad. <laughs> And my dad is an incredibly loving and kind man, but it's a very unique experience to grow up a pastor's kid, a priest's kid, you know. So then when I, you know, moved to college, I was just busy partying and struggling with my own internal demons and sexuality. And the strange thing that I know does make me a weird Christian is that as I started being honest with myself, living authentically, dressing the way I'd always wanted to dress. Like right now, you can't see me, but I'm sporting somewhat of a mullet cut. And I know I look insane, but I love myself (laughs) for it. And once I started really embracing this person who I'd always known in my heart I was, but I was so afraid for societal reasons, probably also some unconscious internalized homophobia that had been deeply ingrained in me within the church as well, because you're not exempt from it. Even though my dad was always affirming, like you still hear and people will say things to you, you know, growing up and you always are aware of that, especially when you're in the closet. Then 
when I started to embrace myself, I had this spiritual curiosity and I started to sort of re-examine my faith again. I sort of came at it with a, a new lens because I knew that I wasn't ever going to be the type of Christian that I was sort of seeing um, built up, I guess. The, the type of Christian is always invited to speak at a conference, like that type of stuff. I knew that was never going to be my walk. So I was able to go back and figure out, okay, let me understand if I want to be a person of faith, what is my theology? Let me get real good with what I believe and why. And there was definitely a period of deconstruction and there doesn't ever need to be reconstruction. But for me, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm definitely I, still in the building phase. I can't stand it, Grace. I, I mean, I have to, I have to go here. Okay. I mean, what are the chances, okay. what, what are the chances that you simply handcrafted a version of Christianity in which you feel comfortable and can play a part. It's almost yeah. like there is a version of the Bible out there called the Queen James Bible, and they just sliced out anything that had anything to do with bigotry against what they consider to be deviant sexuality or sexual practices. So they sort of, mm -hmm. they sort of molded their own faith culture to fit themselves. Do you feel any of that in your own journey? I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I mean, no, 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 I understand. Did I you mean, make a I faith in your I, own image kind of thing? Oh my gosh. I hope not. That'd be an awful thing. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't feel that way. Although I understand where you would be coming from in that. And it's definitely something that I hear. Um, interesting. I hear it from, I guess now the atheist side of things, but I also have heard it from the conservative side of things as well. I think that, to say that I built a faith around what I wanted or what I didn't want from the Bible would presume that I take the Bible literally and that I don't view it as a sacred historical document that should be taken within context, which is what I do believe. So when I read scripture through that lens, it's not really about, it's not at all about picking and choosing because I think we can agree that there isn't a human alive today. I mean, maybe Maybe there is like a weird commune some, somewhere, but there is no human, especially not in the United States living today, that is following what would be biblical law right now. You're not. Like even the most conservative Christians, like no one's doing I'd it. I'd be in jail um, if I was following biblical <laughs> exactly. law oh my today, God. Grace. I would be super in jail. Are you kidding me? I'd be an old, <laughs> old maid, probably dead. I don't know. <laughs> um, the Bible is Game of Thrones, like Game of Thrones type stuff. Lizzie and I, my wife, we were just reading the, this, you know, the verse where people always pull from like an eye for an eye, that yeah. verse, yeah. like that story. So I was like, you know, I never have heard that full story. Like, let me read the full story. And it's gnarly. Like, it's really violent and it's very confusing. There's contradictions within the story itself. It's basically like someone is put to death because they said a curse. And um, then Moses speaks to God, or God, sorry, God speaks to Moses. I don't know, they were talking. And God is like, if anyone kills anybody, then they, are, then they deserve the death penalty. Meanwhile, they end up stoning the guy. So I'm like, wait, y'all all deserve the death penalty. Like what? They're, the Bible is rife with contradictions. And to say that it's not is not being totally honest. Okay, so if the Bible is not um, a literal work of truth, like the major denominations yeah. say that it is, the foundational right. text for living. In a nutshell, well, Grace, yeah. what is the Bible to you then? The Bible is a divinely inspired ancient text that has the account, the lived experience of Jesus who is my savior and lived a life that I take so much inspiration from that is my inspiration for truth. All right. Fair enough. 440. Hi, you're on with Grace Baldridge. Who's this? Hey, Seth. Uh, this is Malachi from Ohio. I was, uh, I've also been raised a preacher's kid, so I can relate to that. But as I got older, I um, escaped that and wanted to, um, you know, experience church for myself by my own without the uh, protection of being the pastor's child. And even I got tired of knowing, as you said, the man behind the curtain, because knowing the humanity of the person running the show really just ruined mm -hmm. the whole thing. And I've been an atheist for almost a decade now. So, you know, I wanted to experience that myself. I've always been in music and church music. And so I went to um, one of the largest churches in the area, hundreds of people, multiple services, 
and I'm playing music with these guys and we've got the fog machine and the lights. And it's like, uh, as a young, you know, 20 something, you know, this was like, all right, this is my taste of arriving. You know, I've never really been in a, a, a band, but it's like, it was a sense of accomplishment being able to play for a lot of people. And at first it was great, but then it turned into this burden of performance. And, um, you know, music should always be played with excellence, but it was, it just became almost a job where, you know, it was all about being perfect and perfection and putting the show on. And I started to realize that, you know, this was just a marketing scheme. This is, this is the bait. What happened, and, and this is how I can, I can't directly relate to the LGBT community, but I can just understand a little taste of it because I experienced divorce while being in the Christian church. And so anyone else that has experienced that can understand that in Christianity, a divorce is just about on par with any kind of sexual deviation in their view, or it's just as horrible. And so um, when I had experienced that, this family of musicians, this thing that I love to do, they, they had turned on me and I was suddenly like, maybe this isn't right for you. You know, we, we can't have, we can't have someone going through this on top of our stage. You know, once you step out of the line, you, you get tossed out. And that was my experience. And it, that was the beginning of my atheism. I came to the realization that these people that I cared about and that I thought cared about me cared more about that than they did the humanity of my suffering and going through a divorce. And so I can only begin to imagine, because that was a temporary thing for me. I mean, that's over. That's long gone. But LGBTQ, someone that that is your life, that is something that you're not going to just get over. You know, that's part of who you are. How do you handle that? How do you go through that? Still being a Christian. Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing your story. And I'm so sorry that that happened. And that is really hard, especially the camaraderie that I know you build within a music group, but then especially with the added component of performing for faith. That's just really sad and unfortunate. I'm really sorry that that happened. Also, I think that you had a really great perspective on the the marketing and like being the bait for new people coming into the doors and the emphasis on perfection. I thought that was really interesting. And then with regards to me being a, a gay Christian, I think that, um, there is a lot of conflict within some denominations and within some Christian communities about someone like me and how they might treat and welcome someone like me. But mercifully, I've been very spared from that because I always belong to an affirming tradition and I never experienced any ostracization or othering. I was asked actually to be a member of my church's vestry like three years ago. And I think they regret it because I'm a really bad member of the vestry. (laughs) My only contribution has been that they wanted to plant salvia plants near the front door. And I told them that if kids dried the leaves, they could smoke them. And they were like, oh my gosh, please get off this board meeting. But um, that's, but that's just kind of an example of like, I've, I've really been very spared and very fortunate in that I've never been made to feel anything other than valued within any church I've ever been part of. And that's just kind of how life unfolded for me. However, in my line of work, I have come across so many people who have been hurt in ways that I think are, are just, I mean, I I rage out a lot. I won't lie to y'all. I think I'm a nice person over the phone, but I privately rage (laughs) because of the the unique and damaging and um, harm that is being perpetuated by church communities, by faith communities that is then um, being legitimized at the political level, at the legislative level. And I think that all of that is wrong. And whenever someone, I'm actually more for a long time, I was more closeted about being Christian than I was about being gay because I recognize that when I say that in a conversation in the where I live, when I say that I'm a Christian, that actually could unintentionally have an impact on someone in a negative way that I wouldn't want at like a party. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if someone has had yeah. a bad experience with a Christian, but I can, I can safely assume that, that in Los Angeles, if I'm like, I'm gay, they're not like, oh, no, I'm so scared of gay people. But if I say, like, I'm a Christian, a lot of times, first of all, it's not really fun to say that at a party, let's be honest. Um, and then the second thing is that 
you can say that and then you have no idea if someone was cast out of their friend group, if they were cast out of their home. We know that homelessness disproportionately impacts LGBTQ plus youth for being who they are. And I'm not okay with that. And I think part of my work in working so closely to have conversations with Christians and the conservative side of Christianity is because I want that harm to stop and I want to do my part. And I think part of that is having really difficult conversations. And in some ways, yeah, it is exposing the harm, you know, in a way that I'm sure that Christians are like, no, 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 don't look over here. Just mind your own business. Just be liberal. Go over there. Be in LA. And I'm like, no, bitch, I'm coming to Alabama. We're going like, I'm coming to you. We're going to Nashville. We're tra- we've traveled all over the country for the show. Hey, I appreciate you calling, agree, my friend. Yeah. That's all. That was yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks I appreciate it. Thank evening. you. There's another clip from the documentary. You interview the uh, lead singer of a huge Christian band, Jars of Clay, and some fallout after they begin to ask some honest questions publicly in regard to acceptance and inclusivity. We are on our way right now to talk with Dan from Jars of Clay. He was the lead singer. If you paid attention to contemporary Christian music at all growing up, like other cool kids like me, then you know that Jars of Clay was a huge band. They were staples of the Christian music industry. I'm curious about what a long career revealed to him about the nature of the industry. I'm Dan Hasseltine, and I am the singer for the band Jars of Clay. You were a pretty big band. We had a good run, I would say. Mm -hmm. We toured for about 22, 23 years. Mm -hmm. If you were reading the bio, it would say multi-platinum, three-time Grammy-winning band Jars of Clay. Same. Yeah. My bio, too. In 2014, Jars of Clay faced backlash after Dan sent out a handful of tweets questioning why people were so adamantly opposed to gay marriage. Lifeway and like all the outlets that sold Christian music had pulled our Jars of Clay stuff off the shelves. We had been disinvited from a bunch of the music festivals and things that we were supposed to do that year. Christian radio had pulled our music off. They weren't going to play it anymore. It was the backlash of the Christian community because I was asking questions about how we treat the LGBT community. The fact that I was asking the questions meant that we were unsafe now. That was the moment where it was just like, okay, I guess we're not going to have this conversation with this community of people. And yet I look at it and I go, I think we were asking the right questions. I don't regret pushing that conversation forward. Mm -hmm. There weren't any other Christian artists that were having that conversation. There Um, aren't. There still really aren't. There really aren't. Yeah. And it's just unfortunate because the other thing I learned from it was just there's so many people that have been hurt really badly by the church. I'm an atheist. I like to, when I phrase it, I say the best teachings of Jesus, because I'm not at all convinced that all of Christ's teachings are worth following, and I don't think he was always a good guy. But you know, a lot I get why a lot of people gravitate to the best teachings of Christ. Essentially, don't be a jerk. Don't be an asshole. Care about other people. Be charitable. Be kind. You know, that kind of thing. Mm. And so when I hear you talk about Christ, that's the kind of Christ that that you follow, right? The Jesus that yes. wanted to go out and those cast out were very important to that Jesus. The people who were disadvantaged, the people who had been wounded in some way, physically, emotionally, or otherwise, you know? I mean, that's your Jesus. Yeah. Would that be fair? I think that would be fair, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to marginalize. I mean, you tell me. What does your Jesus look well, like? Well, no, I mean, you know, it's a sort of like, okay, Jesus in, you know, in five words or less, like condensed in like yeah. 140 characters <laughs> or less. Yeah. It's tricky. Um, no, but I think, I think that your characterization is fair. I, what I, you know, what I am for is um, the teachings of Jesus that we see in the gospel that to me indicate just what you said about caring for the less fortunate, looking out for the least among us political radical who um, was very much against the system as it was and sort of a a thorn in the side of authority. Um, You know, the Jesus that went in and threw out the money changers, right? All right, fine. You're going to turn it into a business. I mean, there are shades of that Jesus that I can actually jive with. But, you know, as far as the non-heterosexual, I mean, I'm thinking of some specific scriptures we got to talk about that. I'm going to bring him up after this short break. Hang on. (music) 
My patrons get this broadcast totally commercial free. And if you'd like to support me and the show, I would be so thankful for your patronage at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Talking with my special guest documentary filmmaker, artist, and producer, Grace Baldridge. We've been getting into the short documentary, The Dark Reality of the Christian Music Industry, and a whole lot more. Right now, we go back to the switchboard. 281, thanks for waiting on me. Hi, who's this? Um, My name is Hannah. I'm from Texas. Hi, Hannah. You're on with Grace Baldridge. Comment or question? What do you think? Well, first of all, I grew up, my dad was a radio station DJ for Christian Radio until he died in 2002. So from the time I was born to then, and even past then for a while, I only listened to Christian music, mostly Christian contemporary at that time. And it always really, you know, it's always really spoken to me. When I was in college, you know, sometimes I would feel as a Christian, because I was a Christian at that time, I, I would feel like I wasn't very close to God, but then I would listen to some contemporary Christian music from that time period, actually specifically Rich Mullins or Delirious or those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And I would always feel so much closer to God at that time, but I, I kind of came to a realization that it really had more to do with nostalgia, that it wasn't really God speaking to me, I guess. Uh, I had a really hard time at that point. I didn't agree with most of the things in the Bible. And I considered myself a Christian for so long, but I just could not reconcile the things in the Bible, especially in relation to the LGBT community. Um, I was not, or at least I didn't think I was. I didn't think I was part of that community, but I really loved a lot of people from that community. And it really bothered me that the people Mm. around me, the adults around me were so set on following the Bible. And I grew up Baptist. So of course it was, Mm. the Bible is literal, but they were so set on taking the Bible literally that they could not get past it. And over time, I actually started listening to Telltale Atheist, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, at one point he was describing something about the Old Testament, and I know it was the Old Testament, and I, you know, at that point I'd thrown it out. You know, I was like, I, I'm not, I, you know, I don't care yeah. what the Old Testament says. I'm just going to follow Jesus because my Jesus is loving, and my Jesus is amazing, and my Jesus cares for people like this. But he was talking about something from the Old Testament, and I. I remember it was this incident in the Old Testament. I don't even remember specifically what passage it was, but it was just death and destruction and apocalyptic. And he made this comment, like, how could a loving God ever even consider something like that? Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment that I just, I realized I didn't believe any of it. It was for you a moral decision. You felt that you could not hold to the morality of the Old Testament or that it didn't happen or both? Yes. So at the, when I was a Christian, I had, I couldn't hold to the morality. Like it was, it was kind of like, I assumed that the Old Testament was probably written by humans who didn't know what they were talking about. And, you know, Jesus came along and changed everything and made it all better. And I didn't see it as a continuity. I saw it as humans trying to understand God is not really a divine work. But at that point, you know, once I realized this can't be a divine work, it was sort of like, well, how can any of it be true? There's a window of time. They say that the the music you listen to when you're a teenager is often the soundtrack of your life, meaning that it becomes the music that you cherish the most. Like it brings back all these memories and it was sort of there when you were, you know, doing this and I was in junior high, middle school, high school, college. And, you know, then when you're my age, 52 and the song plays on the radio, it, it just calls back all these memories of when you were and what you were and what you were doing and who you were with. Is there some truth to that? Is the affection mm-hmm. for some of those songs, does it take you to a, a beloved moment in your life? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a few songs that from a time in my life in high school where I was going through rough times that I would listen to, you know, Christian songs and that I really liked. 
and I still, whenever they come on, whenever I see them on a playlist and I play them, I still feel, you know, it takes me back to those moments. And it's the same with the Christian music that I grew up with while my father was alive. It really just takes me back to those times when he was alive. But it's not you know, it, it doesn't lead me to, you know, I, I'm listening to In Christ Alone, but I'm not thinking about, mm. <laughs> I get you. you know, for sure, In Christ Alone. I'm thinking, oh, this is a song my father liked. And I feel that he's not like literally or even spiritually, but just like figuratively in this music. No, the song so, is connected to a beloved yeah. person and a beloved memory. I, I totally understand. Was that it? Did you have another comment mm-hmm. or question for Grace real fast, or, or was that the comment that you had? That's pretty much it. I guess I find it strange, you know, like a few other callers have said, that you could still believe in these things. And I, I don't want to insult you. I, I, I hope not. No, no, that's not. okay. No, not at all. Because it's it just, I guess, to me, I just don't, I don't see it anymore. And I kind of play the part. I'm actually in the closet myself as an atheist. Um, none of my family knows. Most of my friends don't either. So I, I play the part. Mm. I know what to say in that case. I understand it, but I don't, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Are you saying yeah. you don't understand how she reconciles the atrocities yes. of the Old Testament with her embrace of the Bible? Would that be a fair way to rephrase that? Yes, yes, and yes. Okay. Can I ask Grace to go ahead and elaborate and have that conversation real fast? Absolutely. All right. Appreciate the call very much. Thank you. How would you respond? I mean, I, I, she was oh, walking gently. She didn't want to yeah. insult you, and I appreciate that. But she asked you the question. I think you'd referred to it earlier, the fact that you don't think it's a literal text that is absolutely inerrant yeah. and perfect. This is a construction of human hands, et cetera. But if she presents it that way, come on. I mean, how do you deal with all the shit in the Old Testament, especially, and embrace the Bible? How would you answer that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the Old Testament is gnarly. I, that's putting it pretty mildly. The Old Testament is really violent, disturbing. Um, you talk about biblical marriage. Some of the unions that we see in the Old Testament would make even the most conservative Christian politician blush. So how do I reconcile? I mean, I guess the best way of, of describing how I feel about the Old Testament is, again, to emphasize that I don't view the Bible as a, as a literal at all. Um, and I know that many, the, the, the theology that I subscribe to is consistent in that. And I think that when we, so then when we read these very violent stories and you read the Bible contextually as a whole, much of the violence in the Old Testament sort of plays into the teachings of Christ later on as he calls for peace. So that, I guess that would be sort of my, sort of a short, a short way of, of explaining that. Does I mean, that so if make, I quote to you sense? out of Leviticus, you know, if a man also yeah. lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, yes. both of them had committed the abomination, they shall be put to death. You're unconcerned about that because you don't think that's the word of God. Would that be a way well, to say? Well, first of all, that would definitely be a, a fair way of saying that. And then also, I don't think the Word of God was written in English. I mean, we're looking at, when you look at translations and just sort of the probability of error, probably most of what we have translated into English uh, was nowhere in the original text. And I think that that shouldn't be necessarily a controversial point to come to terms with, Um, that, you know, the English language was was a, a far, far cry away from those early translations of the Bible. And so when you say like, well, homosexuality, the Bible is clear on homosexuality. I was like, well, yeah, the word got in there in 1946. I guess if, if that's your reasoning, then it's been clear since 1946. So, I mean, so much of the Bible for me and biblical literacy, whatever that means, um, is just steeped in culture. And right now, the predominantly who is driving that conversation is Western 20th and 21st century culture. Um, But if you were to look at, you know, interpretations of the Bible and on what marriage looked like in 1700s, 1600s, you'd come to radically different conclusions. So was someone who was right? Are we right now? And the people earlier, they were wrong. Who was right, I guess, is um, something that 
uh, conservative Christians have a hard time with because, you know, they in, like they're insistent that they that no, we, we are definitely the ones that are right. Whereas on my side of things, sort of the Christians that I align with, I'll be the first to tell you, I very well could be wrong. I, like, I recognize that how I move through the world and how I interpret the mystery of faith, I could be so wildly wrong. <laughs> and that's amazing. And that's why I don't want to prescribe what I believe onto anyone else. I, I am that. a dumb human trying to make sense of the world. And I found something... Um, that to me and with the evidence that I see makes sense to me in my heart. But if you were to be like, is it possible that you're wrong, Grace? I'd be like, hell yeah. So, I mean, let's if, if you were to ask that. If there's yeah. a devil, though, and I play his advocate, let's say that I'm God, the good Lord above, okay. looking down. And you kind of sound like him. It's, you oh, you're very nice kind. Voice. Yes. And uh, yeah, on the eighth, <laughs> yeah. Okay. God sees us screwing up the message. Do you think that a benevolent God then parts the curtain of the sky and sort of clears it up. I mean, I'm trying to figure out, and I've gone through this journey in my own mind, and I have questions about Mm. why would the God who is not the author of confusion allow so much confusion when he could sort of say, well, actually, this was translated poorly, and somebody promoted their political agenda here, and this text shouldn't even be in my word. Why do you think God doesn't come down here and clear it all up? Do you ever have that conversation in your own skull? You know, I actually hadn't considered that question before. I think that's a great question. I mean, I don't know. I'm just tossing um, it out there. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but we're talking like real yeah. people, Grace. Of so. course, of course. I think, you know, if I can imagine how someone else might answer that question of like, well, he has, and we see here that this has been clear and we have signs and wonders and blah, 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 blah. And um, I don't want to discredit that type of certainty, but I, you know, within my own beliefs, I rely so heavily on faith. And so I'm, I'm filled with questions. And I think that's a new one that I'm going to add to my Rolodex of uh, insomnia. <laughs> thought. Um, because I think that's a great question. I really do. Of You know, the, a, you know, a God of love beyond confusion. Why are there so, why are we filled still with so many doubts and questions? Surely an all powerful divine creator could clear things up and, Although I I, I will admit that where I stand, I feel pretty clear in my own heart. You know, there's on on certain issues, but there are still so many questions about the suffering in this world that plague me that um, I think sometimes I I think mercifully are beyond my understanding because um, because it's so troubling, you know, and I am I guess I'm sort of grateful that I that I don't that I can't make sense of certain things because I think if I could, that would open a window into um, something far more powerful and perhaps darker than I can understand that I, that I think I'm capable of reconciling. I'll make you this guarantee that I make to everybody. If God exists, I genuinely do want to know that, you know, whatever's true. I, I hear that in your voice, right? I mean, ultimately one day, if you come to the point where it, you know, the house of cards or whatever, if it is a house of cards begins to fall, you're, you're on a journey that you want to live your life, honestly. And I honestly, I just love you to death. Like you are a fantastic human being. I'd like to team up and involve myself in some sort of endeavor or because to me, you care about people. You're trying to do life the right way. You're about inclusivity instead of division and exclusivity. I am a fan. Grace, I really am. Oh, I, thank you. I want to uh, direct people to this documentary or this series, rather, that you are involved with and the rest of your work. So can you sort of tell people where to go to find your stuff? Sure. So if you're interested in watching our documentary series, we've covered a wide range of topics, and I think your audience would be curious to learn more. Look up State of Grace on YouTube And it's by a channel called Refinery29, like an oil refinery, Refinery29. And you'll know that it's my show because my big dumb face is in all the thumbnails. So you'll (laughs) see me there. Just look for a large gay person. And um, then you can follow me on all social media at Grace Baldridge. And if you follow me, you'll mostly just see my wife, my dogs, and my music. And I hope you will. And I love connecting with people on social media. I think it's a wonderful tool to um, get to know each other and build communities of like-minded people. 
You and I just had a great conversation, and look at us. We don't necessarily agree us. about everything, and yeah. we come from different perspectives, and yet I'd like to say we're friends. It's great to call you friend, yes. Grace. Yes. Well, thank you so much for reaching out to me. It was really a pleasure to do your show and to get to speak with um, some people from your audience. Well, I will put a link to your page in the description box of this broadcast, and let's talk again, okay? You take care of yourself. Absolutely. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.